Okay, so we uh, were looking at different types of examples of uh, the application of scanning electron microscopy and we saw how usefully it could be utilized to detect differences between different types of phases. So we were also talking about the fact that when you coat a substrate concrete with an ultra high performance overlay, you can actually make out the distinction between these two types of concrete clearly in an SEM micrograph. In some cases, the overlay concrete or, or rather the substrate concrete may have carbonated which leads to a surface layer of calcite forming and then you can clearly see this layer separating the overlay concrete and the substrate. Now what will happen is as a result of this calcite layer formation, you may actually have a difference in the bond characteristics when you test the strength of the overlay, bonding strength of the overlay on top of the substrate. So we need to be aware of that, that one of the aspects that can actually affect the bond strength could be this layer of carbonated calcite that is forming on the surface. The next, uh, of course, I also uh, would like to mention that the image on the right is actually a complex collection of several images which were later stitched together using an image analysis software. So image analysis will be the focus of our next chapter but for now I just wanted to tell you that these individual boxes represent individual images, okay. So these are individual images which were then stitched together to get this composite image across a long uh, dimension. So you see here that this, this field of width is 150 microns. So high magnification images were taken and stitched together. So approximately we are talking about looking at uh, an entire field of width of just over about 1 millimeter, right. This entire field of width is uh, about 7 times 150 microns. So it is about 1.05 millimeters, right. So that gives you uh, a methodology to actually put together a larger picture, a composite picture from very small high magnification images. And uh, that is where the benefits of image analysis start coming in when used in conjunction with scanning electron microscopy. But we will get to that in the next lecture. Uh, another example here, uh, the influence of temperature on hydration of cement was studied in this uh, scanning electron microscopy study. So what happens is uh, to accelerate the strength gain of concrete, we sometimes enhance the curing temperature. And this curing temperature enhancement is typically done with the help of steam. Now the issue uh, that researchers have found with enhanced curing temperatures is that while it accelerates the early age strength development, there is often a decline in the later age properties primarily strength and durability with respect to normally cured concrete. Okay, steam cured concrete can still have sufficient strength and durability in the long term but in comparison with normally cured concrete, it generally has a lower uh, strength and durability. So here. You can clearly see from the SEM images at 20, 40 and 60 degrees Celsius as to what happens in the microstructure of the porosity. So you can see here that the porosity is gradually increasing as I go from 20 to 40 to 60 degrees Celsius, okay. However, when I use fly ash as a 30 percent replacement for the OPC, I find that my porosity actually seems to reduce or nearly stay the same as compared to 20 degrees Celsius. So what is being shown in this SEM study is that the use of blending materials like fly ash is able to overcome some of the ill effects of heat curing that are typically felt by ordinary Portland cement based systems, okay. Uh, SEM has also been employed significantly to study the structure of different supplementary cementing materials uh, because you can get very clear cut understanding of the phases that are present in the system and also the morphological uh, assessment of the particles that are present in the fly ashes. For example, here you see that these are small uh, spherical solid particles of fly ash which are connected somehow by this loosely held medium, right. This on the other hand is a higher magnification image of a single solid particle because this entire width of field is only 5 microns. So we are talking about something of the order of 15 to 20 microns in diameter. So 15 to 20 microns in diameter is that is a typical size of a fly ash particle, okay. So that is a typical fly ash particle which is spherical in nature. This is a polished sample of a fly ash. Now in the previous case it was a secondary electron image because you could clearly see the spherical particles and you can see the depth of field that is shown by the secondary electron image. This is also fly ash, it is just that the condensation 
of the gas along with the fly ash can sometimes create irregular shaped particles also. Sometimes you can also get obloid particles. Okay. So, some of these spherical particles of silica in fly ash may get trapped between larger agglomerates which may have gas inside also. Okay. So, it is just the way that the condensation of the gas happens along with the fly ash that leads to the formation of different types of phases. So, th the other uh, irregular shapes the, which are seen around the spherical particles may also be attributed to the impurities that you have in fly ash. Of course, fly ash is only if you look at class F or siliceous fly ash, uh, it is generally composed of 50 to 60 percent silica. Okay. So, you still have remaining 30 to 40 percent of mostly impure phases. So, when you take the same fly ash, embed it in an epoxy and then polish it, you get a slightly different sort of an image. You obviously would not be able to make out the full sphere. What you will be getting are the projections of the spheres on a horizontal plane which is nothing but a circle. So, you see all these circular features here that is basically resulting from the polishing of the spherical particles of fly ash. So, these are all fly ash samples. So, you can see that fly ash also has these irregular features here and those could be mostly the impurities like quartz. Okay. If you take an x-ray diffraction of fly ash, you will find that there are some phases crystalline phases like quartz and malite which may be present in the system. Okay. So, those irregular particles could be well made of quartz or sil other siliceous components, okay. crystalline siliceous components. Now, what you are seeing here are two different fly ashes. One is a as collected fly ash from a thermal power plant. The other is a processed fly ash that means the ash is collected from the thermal plant and brought to a factory and processed to control its chemical, chemical composition and physical properties. What you see here are your fly ashes or the size distributions the particle sizes of the fly ashes on the left are varied between a very large range. On the other hand, on the right the image shows that the particles of fly ash are more controlled to the smaller ranges. Okay. So, if you buy the process fly ash typically you see that the performance in concrete is much more well defined. Whereas, when you buy these or when you get the as collected fly ashes which is practically free of cost you only have to arrange for the transportation to collect this material, it gives you highly variable properties in the cementitious matrix. So, most ready mix concrete suppliers would collect fly ash directly or get it through suppliers who are collecting fly ash and distributing to the RMC manufacturers. Problem there is you get high variability. When you actually get fly ash like that you get very high variability. On the other hand when you use process fly ash you can control to a very significant level the quality of the concrete, the performance of the concrete. Okay. In textbooks we often read that the use of fly ash as a cement replacement increases workability of concrete. But when you work with some as collected fly ashes, you will find that the workability is actually not increased, it sometimes is even reduced okay. because the as collected material may also have a high degree of carbon present in it, unburnt carbon present in it, which you do not have a control of. Whereas, in a process fly ash, all that is very well controlled. Okay. That is why the cost increases, but at the same time you get a much better performance. Now, silica fume is another metal admixture which is known to densify the cementitious matrix and increase the strength and durability in the long run. So, this is some examples of silica fume at varying levels of replacement. So, this is 100 percent PC that means no silica fume, this is 10 percent silica fume, this is 25 percent and that is 45 percent silica fume. Of course, nobody would be using silica fume at 25 and 45 percent unless it is for something like a ultra high performance composite or a reactive powder concrete only in those cases will we use such high levels of silica fume. 25 percent is what we will use, 45 is probably never because dispersion of silica fume into a cementitious matrix will be a challenge since silica fume has particle sizes of the order of tenths of microns. Cement is 15 micron, silica fume is of the order of 0.1 to 0.5 micron. So, at that particle size trying to disperse this uniformly in a cementitious medium is a big problem. Okay. So, nevertheless, in this study, since they were doing this study on paste, they could very well formulate the right mechanisms for dispersion and they found very clearly that what can you see from this picture? Broadly you can see that the porosity keeps decreasing as I go from 100 percent PC to increasing levels of silica fume. 
the paste is becoming more and more dense. Okay, I am basically decreasing my porosity and the amount of calcium hydroxide that you see is going on reducing. So, as I put more reactive silica in it, it will start consuming more and more calcium hydroxide. Now, again one of the common understandings of uh, cement paste hydration that has been achieved by SEM is in understanding the structure of the hydration products that are forming. So, here this is examples of deposition of ettringite crystals near a void in a cement paste system. Now, in this case of course, what we are seeing is a secondary electron image of a large void in limestone calcium clay binder, I am sorry not BSC. This is SE mode, secondary electron mode image near a void in a limestone calcium clay binder. So, limestone calcium clay binders are where we replace cement with a mixture of limestone and calcium clay. Okay. Now, what happens when you replace with limestone calcium clay is that the chemistry works in such a way that the ettringite that forms in the initial phases of cement hydration remains stable and does not convert to monosulphate. So, when you look at LC3 binders, you will you expect to find more ettringite in the system and indeed you can see these needle like features which are basically your ettringite deposits that are forming inside the system. Now, SEM can also be applied to study heritage materials. So, in this case, this is an SEM study of lime mortar from a heritage structure, but what was also seen is there is presence of these crystal well defined crystals of gypsum. Okay. These are needle and prisms of gypsum that have formed in the lime mortar. So, why would gypsum form inside the lime mortar? It could be because of external moisture or rain carrying sulphates into the system. So, when sulphates enter the system obviously, they have a chance of uh, converting the lime present to gypsum. So, you can get gypsum deposition inside lime mortar either due to acid rain, acid rain could be one of the reasons or maybe the ground water itself may have penetrated uh, seeped up with the sulphates inside which led to the formation of gypsum. Now, delay ettringite formation is a specific circumstance where uh, you have the formation uh, suppression of ettringite formation at the early stages and this ettringite which is suppressed at early stages may be because of very high temperatures of curing will reappear at later stages in the hardened cementitious matrix causing cracking. Now, very often we miss the point where it appears inside the cementitious system, but we only start looking at these features of ettringite deposition which form around the aggregate. And initially when DEF was examined by scanning electron microscopy, researchers came to an erroneous conclusion that you needed to have voids and cracks in the system for DEF to happen. What they surmised was that if you have voids and cracks present in the system only then would the ettringite recrystallize and cause expansion and cracking. But later subsequent research proved that this ettringite that was forming was in the dense cementitious matrix itself. It is only reasonable that it forms in very small pores inside this cementitious matrix because when it does, it will exert a large amount of pressure. Because ettringite is expansive, if it forms inside a small pore, it will exert a much larger pressure than if it forms at such locations where already high porosity is available. So, what researchers were able to conclude is that the ettringite formation typically started off in the very small pores of the CSH itself, okay, created a lot of expansive stresses that resulted in cracking and subsequently this ettringite redeposited in the regions where cracks and voids were present because it was able to nucleate and grow into larger crystals. So, again if you look at the zone around the aggregate, you see a lot of ettringite there, but that is only an after effect the cracks have already appeared, the ettringite has simply gone and redeposited in these pores. Uh, this is an SEM image of polymer modified mortar. So, sometimes we use uh, latex modified concrete, we use styrene and butadiene rubber or latex uh, which is added in a liquid medium into the concrete and as the cement sets and hardens, the monomeric features of styrene butadiene end up for forming a polymer and this polymer film ensures that you get a very dense structure which is impermeable to water 
and it also affords some degree of elasticity to the concrete, flexibility to the concrete because of obviously it is rubber, right. So, here this is an interpenetrating network of polymer and hydration product that is seen to be forming inside the cementitious system that is hydrating, okay. And this polymer hydration interaction product is basically bridging particles of cementitious matrix to ensure that there is good degree of den denseness in the overall structure that actually forms. Now, this is another example of a study which we had done here to look at what happens when concrete is cured at moderately elevated temperatures. So, this was a study that we had performed for Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research where uh, they wanted to find out uh, the concrete in the shielding sorry not in the shielding in the in the outside the nuclear vault which may have a high temperature right because of the nuclear reactions there is obviously gamma rays and x-rays which try to come out which are shielded by the high density concrete on the top. But because of the reactor vessel increasing in temperature you need to have a cooling system around it to ensure that the temperatures are kept down and then the concrete is there surrounding this nuclear reaction vault okay to provide the structural stability. The only problem is you have to invest a lot in getting the cooling system to cool down the system from very high temperatures to less than about 100 degrees Celsius. Now, the issue is the cooling system can be uh, made a lot more economical if they understand that concrete can withstand higher temperatures. Typically, the nuclear, uh, nuclear code ACI code for nuclear structures says that the concrete temperature should not exceed 65 degrees Celsius in the outer vault outside the, the protecting concrete which is surrounding the vault the temperature should not exceed 65 degrees Celsius. Because of that they have to invest a lot in the right level of cooling systems. So, the study here would, was to show that you can increase this permissible temperature limit up to 75 without really causing much damage to the concrete. And to understand that we did a vast range of tests including mechanical properties and all that. One of the aspects was to study what happens to the internal structure of the paste when you heat it across this temperature range. One of the common features that happens in cementitious materials as you heat it between 0 and 100 is that the free water that is available obviously starts getting removed. Now, this free water is there in the capillary porosity obviously, which is larger compared to the gel porosity which is within the CSH. So, what we are seeing here as compared to the control concrete, when you increase the temperature 65, 75 and 90, what you end up doing is desiccating the CSH. This is the inner CSH forming in the system and you can see the cracks inside the inner CSH. So, what is happening there is that there is a desiccation of the inner CSH because CSH you know that has pores and the water in the gel pores is trying to migrate out which is expected because less than 100 degrees Celsius the water that is not chemically bound will start to migrate out and this desiccation is resulting in cracking. So, apart from this obviously, we saw no macro level effects and ultimately this study led to the conclusion that up to 75 degrees temperature are not going to pose any problems with respect to any of the properties of the concrete. Okay. So, what is the advantage here? The 10 degrees additional temperature that you give to the concrete can actually help in reducing the extent of effort that you need to put into the cooling system. This is another uh, example of a study that was performed here in our lab uh, by Mohammad Hanifa. He worked on uh, another project for the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. So, you might have heard about uh, the Bhavani reactor that uh, Ajikar Kalpakam has actually uh, just recently inaugurated. Uh, it is not yet started producing uh, electricity, but then it is soon going to be start uh, starting to get critical. Uh, the idea is that this is a completely indigenous type of a reactor that has been uh, produced by India and they want to replicate it in several locations to start processing nuclear energy for electric power. Now, this is a very different reactor as compared to the typical heavy water reactor, uh, reactors that are available in most parts of the country. This is called a prototype fast breeder reactor okay. and this fast breeder reactor works with liquid sodium as a coolant. So, you know the nuclear reactions increase the temperature you need some sort of a cooling system to reduce the temperature. So, liquid sodium is here used as a coolant. Interestingly, to produce liquid sodium you need to heat sodium above 450 degrees Celsius. 
So although it is a coolant, it is still at a high temperature and when it goes into the system and extracts the heat from the system and comes out, it is now at 550 degrees Celsius.